whirlwind of information, faces, names coming out of Penn State's 2022 season recap. But really what it is, it's turning the chapter to 2023. We have a lot of things to discuss. Greg Pickle and myself are here with you. We met with a lot of important players for next season. We got to meet Penn State's new receivers coach, Marcus Higgins. And of course, James Franklin kicked the day off. But really what we're here to do is answer your questions. We were there, but uh, a lot of stuff happened. So let us know what you want to know on the BWI Daily Edition live show. Over the next hour, we're going to be hearing from James Franklin, from Marcus Hagens, and uh, a little bit from some players, including Deny Dennis Sutton. We were able to uh, go and gather all the sound and all the thoughts and everything. Um, although, Greg, I don't know that I've gathered, gathered a single thought at this point. A whirlwind of a day. Sometimes I'm sitting here at the end of the day, I'm a bit overwhelmed in terms of the information we took in. So uh, there has been a little bit of time. I know you had to drive back to Harrisburg to kind of digest. First off, thanks for being here after a long day. Secondly, what is the thing that stands out to you, the thing that you remember from today that when I say all that stuff comes to mind? Yeah, good evening, T. Frank, and everyone out there listening. Hope everyone's doing well. I mean, I think the biggest takeaway for me is Penn State is now officially moving into the 2023 chapter. As you said just a moment ago, winter workout started today. We got a full list of position coaches picking uh, players that stood out in their specific uh, part of the team earlier today. And then, of course, as you mentioned, James Franklin, uh, Marcus Higgins, and a bunch of class of 2022 signees. So good day overall. A lot of info to be gathered, but the biggest sign me is that we have now officially even though i think many people probably did it after the rose bowl uh put the 2022 season behind us and james franklin talked a little bit about the final signing in the class of 2023 jim the ono of course and what he means to this program and what that get meant uh for penn state so that was the last bit of news on the class of 2023 and I, I, correct me if i'm wrong but i don't believe the 2022 season came up at all today it was all pretty much <laughs> forward facing which is how these things typically go so that was my main you know 500,000 foot view takeaway is that we are now on to 2023 the winter workouts are underway there's going to be eight sessions of those over the next three weeks and before we know it t frank spring practice is going to be here yeah and it's going to go very quickly from there as well so it's uh the the thing that i think stood out to me today and i this is intentional is James Franklin, one of the first things he talked about outside of his opening statement about Jimmy Ono was leadership. He made it loud and clear that this team is building not just athletes this offseason. They're trying to build leaders. And that then that became the storyline of the day, you know, kind of like the the what leads off the morning news. And then you talk about it later in the afternoon and so on and so forth. So we talked to a lot of players about leadership. We talked to a lot of, uh, you know, young players about leadership. So in in that tone. How do you feel about that setting the tone for 2023 for James Franklin to bring up something as important, but also elusive as player leadership? Yeah, you know, I think obviously there's a good reason it's a talking point. Our Nate Bauer wrote about it at bluewhiteillustrated.com. You know, two time team captain or more T Frank are, I guess, in some instances, less or uh, more common rather in the next they will be for the next couple of years in a lot of programs because of the COVID year teams have but I was just looking up I want to take you back to 2021 Penn State's captains were uh, Rasheed Walker, Jonathan Sutherland, Jordan Stout, uh, Sean Clifford, PJ Mustafer, and Jaquan Brisker so obviously when you go into 2022 you have Mustafer back you have Clifford back you have Sutherland back and you have at least that core group of leaders in addition to some guys that uh, were logical choices to join them as captains in 2022 but this year uh your list of captains is all gone i mean sean clifford obviously moving on pj mustafer uh sutherland is moving on chris stoll is moving on jair brown so you are now out that uh, leadership group that has been here for at least two years and in some cases obviously much longer than that in significant roles so you have a lot of work to do in that regard to bring players forward into a spotlight that 
they are, are in some cases going to be ready for, and in some cases, maybe not. I think the one line that sticks out to me, uh, you can kind of made me think of it when you said what sort of sticks out in your mind when you think back on this day was Zane Durant saying that Drew Aller's a leader. He just doesn't know it yet. And we asked, well, what does that mean? You know, what are you getting at there? And he said, well, said he knows how to be a leader. He just needs to be more vocal. And yeah, your starting quarterback better be vocal. He better have that component. And I think Drew Aller will, assuming he is Penn State starter this year, as many expect. But yeah, this talking point is not going to go away. And as James Franklin correctly noted, uh, you can't be figuring this out in August or uh, June, for that matter, or even May. These are things yeah. you have to get right now. And I'm not saying you're going to name your team captains in March during spring practice, but you better have a pretty strong group of guys emerging to the front of that pack, T. Frank, to be your next captains and to be the next group of guys underneath them. So Penn State has a lot to do in that regard here because, as we know, a lot of that experience is moving on. Yeah, and it's it's such a fascinating situation. and It really speaks to what Penn State had last year, which was they had a lot of young, talented players who we got to speak to today, but also it had a lot of veterans, and, and that that core of players was a, was a large catalyst to why they were able to finish strong after some disappointing games. The talent is still there. I, I think outside of a couple of obvious players, Penn State probably upgrades at some positions. And, and the, the, the hard part of this conversation of having respect for Sean Clifford, but five-star Drew Aller with the tools and the things we'll get into here in a bit, including how fast he could throw a baseball as a freshman in high school, um, they make you optimistic for the future, but leadership is so important. We saw in 2020 when they didn't feel like they had strong leadership, how that season spiraled. So I guess that's kind of my curiosity is, do you feel confident in the talent or do you feel concerned that the leadership needs to grow out of that young talent? And, and where is it coming from? Are the upperclassmen uh, ahead of these guys able to fill that void as well? Because you know, it, it, you, you need both of it. And when James Franklin, line A is, okay, we need to find these guys. I, th I think that's going to be um, obviously a talking point from now until sp through spring practice, but it's going to be something that we, we need to revisit next year in the context of, you know, this conversation. We have a couple of things I want to get to here quickly. Steven is back. Steven is here all the time. Love Steven Light. He says, yay. The li the uh, the lives on Tuesday loves the live show. He's gonna settle back and listen, donating to the channel. If you'd like to donate to the channel, we would love that. Um, we'll thank you here on air. You'll get your shout out, and of course, if you have a question attached to it or comment, as long as it's not profane, we'll read it on the show. Um, but also, if you want to know something about today, you want to hear just more than our thoughts about somebody. You want something specific? Ask your question in the chat. A little bit of a sleepy chat tonight, so get at it. I want to know what you want to talk about because there's a, there's a lot of stuff that came out of today. Um, James Franklin, anything else that he said that drew your interest from his 30 minutes of conversation with reporters? Yeah, obviously, uh, we mentioned it at the top of the show, T. Frank, but the Chimney Ono edition, they feel really good about. I thought it was interesting that they pointed out the fact James Franklin did that he had very interesting basketball film and Phil Troutround was able to watch him play basketball. And that was something that I think really attracted Penn State to him, and maybe not as much as his football tape, but certainly that played a pretty significant role in Penn State deciding to really push all of its chips in uh, with him and end up landing the the four-star uh, the four star uh, offensive lineman, if I can get yeah. the words out tonight, uh, you know, in the second signing day here, which again, I think it's only been uh, seven or eight guys, I think, in since the second signing day existed that Penn State's been able to go and get during the second signing day. Sometimes that's just interest based, sometimes it's space based. Uh, but there's not, the point being, there's not a ton of examples of. Penn State really pushing all out to get guys on the second signing day. Uh, but when they like a guy like they do with Chimney Ono, they obviously uh, want to go get him. And especially when you're competing against a Big Ten foe like Michigan State and some others, Rutgers, of course, and Ole Miss, uh, you want to be able to lock that guy up and not uh, be facing him somewhere down the road uh, should he reach the ceiling that you think he's going to. So and that jumped out to me, and obviously there was a lot of calls, call, talk rather about the class of 2022, and we talked about the receivers coach change and pretty much hit on all the topics that you would have expected. I know that receiver one's one, Steve Frank, that you want to dive into uh, at some point here during the show as well. But, you know, I, I guess the only other thing that really jumped out at me was just the conversation about 
can the early signing day continue to exist with the transfer portal, with the expanded playoff on the horizon, and the fact that more teams will be playing more games during a very important recruiting time? And James Franklin kind of, you know, I, I think I agree with him, and I don't want to boil down his response to just one line, but, you know, when he said, I think at some point we can't just keep changing things, yep. and not that they're doing it right now necessarily, but there's a lot of talk about it. At some point, you have to just set your plan and go with it. Because all you're doing every time you change things is resetting the learning curve and resetting yep. the the calendar. And, and you're basically taking one thing that may not be that great and creating another thing that may not be that great. So at some right. point here, uh, I think they just need to make up their mind and ha and stop having the conversation every year about what that's going to look like. But, you know, that was really the only, I think, backward facing topic that came up during the day. As we said earlier, most of it was pretty front frontward facing as we get into 2023. Uh, yeah, we got a couple of questions and some comments here in the chat. One thing that came up, and, and um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. It was, I felt the same way that Kreiner feels, uh, Kreiner back here on the live show. He felt like Franklin's comments or lack of comments on Taylor Stubblefield were interesting. Previous firings, he said, thank you, been a little more, um, maybe not as to the reasons why somebody was fired, but a little talked about it a little bit more. Um, is there something there that you find interesting or is that kind of a move along because we're not going to ever get to know the story? Cause yeah, it's the same I, house. I, I lean more that way T Frank. And I think maybe, you know, it, you can sit there and say, thank a guy for his, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, obviously I'm sure he means it, but I don't want to say it's not a genuine comment, but at the end of the day, uh, you've made a decision to move on. And sometimes there's hurt feelings. Sometimes there's not what that, what there is in this case, we don't know. Cause he had no interest in getting into it, but now I don't read too much into that in fact when i asked the question i was expecting to get less than what i got on taylor stubblefield because yeah. obviously you know the, the way to spin that that conversation forward is always to just focus on uh marcus Hagen. so i was not expecting to get much there but i just wanted to see what would happen uh by asking it so you know we got what we got but no i don't read too much into that i can understand certainly the reason that you would want to do that or think that there's a reason to do that but yeah i'm not reading a ton into that at this point other than they decided to make a decision and you know, he talked a little bit about needing guys that can recruit and can coach and not just be one or the other. And I'm not trying to tie those words to Taylor Stubblefield in that decision. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, just like any job you have, uh, whether you're a football coach or whether you are, you know, someone that, you know, whatever you do, uh, you know, you're going to be graded on being able to do all parts of the job well. And if you're not, if you're struggling in one area and you're not making improvement, then changes might be made. And again, I don't know if that was the case in this particular instance of Penn State going in a different direction. But, you know, I read more into those comments looking forward. And, you know, when you realize down the road why things happen or why changes are made, you can go back to these comments and, and try and piece yeah. together what reason might be behind it. So the, this is this is a perfect example. I. I forgot you asked that question. <laughs> I asked that question of you just now, forgetting that you were the one that asked that question. So much happened today. So much happened today. Another question here in the chat. Bill Nye does Minecraft. Love that. Joseph Mateo asks, is safety a concern for next year? I'm not that educated on it, but it seems like a weak point. So this is actually a really interesting situation of perspective, I guess. Uh, I did the final roster reset earlier uh this week on sunday with the nittany lines or i don't remember what day it was don't ask me what days are anymore um but what i found you know kind of going back and looking at the film and doing a little bit more research than just looking at the roster of okay how did they actually play last year it, with manny diaz what are the intricacies of that and what i came away with was wow tig brown did everything so th there's, th I'm going to dig into this a little bit more later in the week, but there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm not as sold on the top line veterans returning, having a Tig Brown breakout level season, but there are vet, like there are talented players behind those guys. So do you, again, the veterans that are ahead of them, Jalen Reed and Keaton Ellis, do they provide the leadership you're looking for? Can they, you know, not just lead, but play well? And then can they coexist with Kevin Winston and with Zaki Wheatley, who are very, very talented football players and, uh, you know, are up and coming? So that's the dynamic to me. And how do you replace what Tig Brown did? Do you have any thoughts on any of that? Because um, I know we're pretty far away from the season and might not have been on your mind. 
Yeah, I mean, I would just say this. I think that you kind of hit the nail right on the head here, T. Frank, and that's what kind of step are Keaton Ellis and Jalen Reed going to make that make you think that they can replicate what Jair Brown did last year. And I would be willing at this moment in time uh, to say that KJ Winston and Zaki Wheatley, for my money, have a chance, I think, to make that jump in a more likely anyway to make that jump than Keaton Ellis and Jalen Reed are. Now, I think Jalen Reed did some nice things last year, and I think there were also some games where it didn't look like he was fully uh, striving to the potential that it seems like he could have. I think with Keaton Ellis, you pretty much know what you're getting at this point. Obviously, he's been here a long time. He was a corner first. Now he's a safety. So, you know, I don't know. You, you know, you knew with uh, Jair Brown coming in, same with Jaquan Brisker, that the junior college that first year then at the, in the Big Ten would be one thing, and then what could it be the year after that? And, you know, these guys have obviously been playing Big Ten football. So, you know, I, I would just say this, uh, and I, I don't have the question in front of me, so I forget how it was worded, but if the question was, should you be concerned about the safeties, my answer would be no, and it's because Anthony Poindexter is coaching them. And if we know anything Bingo. about Anthony Poindexter, we know that he can develop talent. We know that he's going to find ways to improve weaknesses of his players. We have uh, loads of evidence of it. Uh, at this point, T. Frank, and we're seeing guys progress under his leadership. There's a reason Penn State added that co-defensive coordinator title uh, to his uh, line. Uh, I think it was last year, if memory serves correctly. I mean, he's an important part of this program. One of the reasons for that is he can recruit. One of the other reasons is he can coach really well. We just got done talking about how important those two things are in terms of what you want your staff makeup to be. So, no, I wouldn't be concerned about it at this point. Are there areas where it needs to be, you know, there's going to be needs that need to have some leaps made? Yes. Are there guys that are going to have to make steps forward that they haven't totally taken yet, regardless of whether they're an older guy or younger guy? Yes. Uh, but I think right now, as we sit here on February 7. You should feel pretty good that Anthony Poindexter is going to get them there. Now, I will say, maybe I'll have a different answer after we see some guys on the field in spring practice and all of that. But right now, yeah. uh, that is not at the top of the list of things I would be concerned about if I was a Penn State fan, looking at this roster makeup and where things are heading into uh, you know the rest of the month of February here and the rest of winter workouts. You make a good point, and I'll spin that uh, up to Manny Diaz as well, where last season they used three safeties, you know, like we expected, Tig Brown in, in kind of that specialty role. But he also played Curtis Jacobs at the Sam linebacker, which I didn't think was going to happen. Like, I just didn't think they were going to do that for a number of reasons. But I think they, the, as a group, they showed the mental flexibility and, and the, you know, growth and all of those things as a coach to – you have these players, how do you use them best? And if they don't have three safeties that are performing at the highest level and you don't have a guy like Tig Brown that can do all of those things for you, find another guy, find another uh, sub package that works. And, and I think that that will be, I, they do, you're right. They do have the talent and they have the coaching to get the most out of those guys. So I, I would, I think we both kind of lean in the same direction. Yeah. Although I was slam dunk, strength of the team, secondary, strong as, as it was last season because of those young guys. But I, I'm just interested to see how that develops first before I say, you know, kind of go back to that point in, right. in my process. Uh, I want to get to something here quickly. Uh, as always, please subscribe to Blue White Illustrated here on YouTube. I don't know if I talked about that earlier. Greg, I gave people 24 minutes of Drew Aller's face today. Yes. I gave them what they wanted. I get, I give you what you want here each day on the BWI Daily Edition. I hope we talk about recruiting. We talk what I'm getting at, what I'm driving at here, Greg, is that we are so close to 10,000 subscribers to reaching that milestone. We are less than 100 away. So tell your friends, if you're watching this and you haven't subscribed yet, do a man a favor. I'm dying over here. I'll do, I'll do what you need. Whatever it is, leave it in the comments, and we'll do that as long as we get to 10,000 subscribers. Also, I want to thank our uh, show sponsor here today, the, our live show sponsor. That is rogue shop they are a small batch cannabis farm in wisconsin they are a uh, a the main supporter of the bwi daily edition and of the live show they've been with us for months and months now and i've talked about a lot of this greg where uh, i'm i'm uh telling you about the stuff that i've used and from them that they they gave us so that i know what i'm talking about because here's the thing i don't know what i'm talking about like i am not i am new to cannabis but i will tell you a story and this is not a joke. This is not an embellishment. I don't know how to do that. This is just my life. Last, this Sunday, my wife said to me, hey, 
does this look weird over here? Does this part of the floor look weird to you? And I said, no, that's how it was when we bought the house. I don't think that that's new. Last night we walk over and the dishwasher is flooding the hardwood floor. Um, and I had, I didn't realize this was going to happen, but I wanted to get a good night's sleep. So I had taken a half of a Delta 9 edible gummy. And I have never been so calm through a crisis before, Greg. I have water going into the basement. And I'm like, okay, let's figure out how to fix this instead of what I would normally do, which is have a panic attack and freak out. So I can tell you right now, rogueshop.com, they can provide you with things to reduce stress, anxiety, help you get to sleep. Because after that, by the way, it happened at 9.30 because no calamity ever happens at 6.30 in the evening at a normal time where you can deal with it. I slept so well last night despite all that stuff. So this stuff works if you have problems in that vein, uh, which is the one that I use it for. Go to rogueshop.com. Use the promo code BWI for 10% off so you can get uh, a little bit off and you let them know you come from us. So promo code BWI for 10% off at rogueshop.com. Um, Marcus Hagens. I want to talk to you about Marcus Hagens and your first impressions of him uh, when we got to meet him today. What were your thoughts? Great. Uh, you know, again, I, I think I wrote this last week at some point, either in the Saturday Six Pack or somewhere else on BlueEyedIllustrated.com. But, you know, no one has ever lost one of these opening press conferences, T. Frank, the first time that they sit in front of reporters as either a assistant coach or a coordinator or a head coach. You know, I, I can't think of any, if many, uh, instances at Penn State, and certainly not at Penn State, but even across the country, where you read reports that come out of these things that say, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about this one. This probably isn't going to work out. I mean, they typically are uh, good natured and, uh, you know, you hear the the coach's vision and obviously sounds terrific of what he's going to do, how he's going to do it and so on and so forth. So, but no, I mean, I think the, the main takeaway I had was we have heard almost endlessly that Marcus Hagens is a guy who is uh, able to build relationships and able to bond with people and able to communicate very well. And all of those things were on display today. And then, you know, it was reinforced uh, the one difference that we had in this setting compared to the usual setting for these is that we heard from players straight afterwards. So yeah. in most instances, it's just James Franklin. It's just a new coach. And then that's it. But with Penn State uh, being, uh, you know, willing to have the class of 2022 guys available today, we were able to go right upstairs and talk to Tyler Johnson or Anthony Ivey or Christian Driver or Caden Saunders and get a firsthand account of what the first impression is. And let's, let's remember one thing here. It's February 7th. Penn State was on the road recruiting from the time Marcus Higgins got hired until uh, what? Last Tuesday, I guess it was, or mm -hmm. Monday or Tuesday. So, I mean, these guys have had less than a week to really sit down and get to know him. Now, they may have seen him in the hallway, depending on this, that, or the other thing, or maybe he met with them quick before hitting the road recruiting. But long and short of it is, is that their relationship and their time of getting to know him is just really beginning. But they all talked about how well he communicates with them already and kind of the positive and uplifting way in which he goes about his communication with them and so on and so forth. So I have no reason to believe that, this isn't going to work out for Penn State. Now, again, I think that his past has shown that he can develop players and that one way he could maybe take another step forward is in that recruiting department where he's had success. But, you know, again, when you're at Virginia, you're not going to win a lot of battles for higher rated players because guess what? Uh, if Penn State wants them or somebody wants to come in and get them, uh, in a lot of instances, they're going to get them. So I yeah. don't think you can view his recruiting track record in a ball, in a, you know, in, in just wins and losses because there's a lot more to it than that. But I also think it's fair to say that that's one way he can improve as a coach. So Penn State obviously is a much easier place to recruit. He has a lot of connections. And like James Franklin said, he's going to be able to rely on those Virginia ties that he has, but he's also going to have to recruit some areas that maybe he's not familiar as familiar with or where he hasn't really recruited before. And that's the areas uh, or that's the, the, the part of his coaching profile that can evolve. So I was impressed. I, again, I think that all of the things I thought going in that I expected to see, uh, excuse me, T Frank, were seen. And uh, now we'll see what he does with these guys moving forward here. There's no doubt there is a lot for him to figure out at this point. To go back to the question about the safeties earlier, I mean, you're talking a lot of the same stuff with 
the wide receivers, which, you know, one thing we didn't, we should have touched on, I should have had you add this to the rundown, but, you know, Malik McCann received a ton of praise yep. today from yep. teammates and uh, coaches alike. You know, but I think James Franklin was noted the smile that's always on his face. And uh, a couple of the teammates I talked to of his has said the same thing. He's a quiet business like guy who comes in, gets to work and does his thing. So seems like he is fitting in quite nicely. Of course, the Florida state transfer that uh, came to Penn state back for the start of the spring semester. The, the there's, a lot that goes into this receiver position. I want to sit here for a second with the with the coach, with some of James Franklin's comments and some of the players. Um, the the thing that I think stood out to me, you mentioned his his communication and just being very good up there in front of the microphone. And uh, one of the things he talked about was just authenticity and how do you relate to players? And I just, I love this answer. You and I talked about this. So I just wanted to share this clip. We'll have his full press conference coming up tomorrow or the majority of it coming up tomorrow. So again, another great reason to subscribe to Blue White Illustrated on YouTube, but here are his comments on how do you build relationships? What are the first steps? I think the first thing is you got to be vulnerable. Like you got to be willing to give those guys your troops, like who you are, where you come from and not just speak from, you know, the vantage point of, of having done it all correctly, like be open to the mistakes that I've made and then just really not so much talking, like listening. Like I need to listen to those guys. I need to hear who they are. A lot of times you can kind of, you know, stunt the, the progress of developing relationships based upon talking too much. So a lot of times just listening to those guys, giving them a voice to tell me who they are. And then as we continue to grow, see if that aligns with how they work, how they go to class, who they are, you know, in practice and who they are in the game and just helping them grow constantly. I think that's, those are the initial steps, but I would say listening more than talking and then talking and giving the truth when they ask questions that relate to, to me in, in particular. So, I mean, listening and and you know empathy it's not rocket science but also to hear it explained clearly and to say this is what i'm about i think that is um a, a huge step i don't want to say a step in the right direction saying that taylor stubblefield didn't but like the the idea of relating to players and and having like an authentic way of going about it that seems to be something that is a winning formula to get to the players on your team but also seems like a great fit for how Penn State recruits as well so that he seems to fit in pretty well to the fabric of the team yeah I don't think there's any doubt about that I think that again when you see the hires that James Franklin makes they all kind of come from a similar mold for the most part and you know with with Marcus Higgins having such a close bond with Anthony Poindexter you of course uh, can see a lot of Poindexter in Higgins I think and obviously if for those who don't know the story they're both Highly regarded Virginia alums, obviously, uh, you know, Hagen's played under Poindexter for a brief period of time, and then he coached with him later uh, at Virginia before Anthony Poindexter came to Penn State. So you can see a lot of the same qualities that come out in Poindexter and Hagen's, which makes sense because he said that uh, Hagen's, that is, that Poindexter was one of his greatest mentors, as is Alan Iverson, interestingly enough. I didn't know that <laughs> uh, before yeah. today, but we learned that as well. So, uh, yeah, interesting guy. Uh, very good track record so far of taking. I want to. I don't. I lesser recruited is probably the better way to put it because I don't know if all these guys were lesser talented than some of their peers that were ranked higher in their class, but lesser recruited guys and turning them into very successful college receivers. So we'll see. Um, every hire, you know, when you evaluate it, you look at the pros, the cons, and the results so far. But you know, again, I think you have to be careful with putting a ton of stock always in the results. Because, again, every situation is different. Every school is different. Every offense is different in this particular case. And, you know, to be able to judge production of the receiver spot, you better have a good grasp on what that guy's been dealing with in terms of the offense he's been coaching him. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's been a couple for, for Hagen's at Virginia. So I like the hire. I liked it when it was announced. I like it now. But, you know, as always is the case, and this goes for whether it was Mike Yursich or Manny Diaz or Taylor Stubblefield or Jaywan Sider or – whoever, Tim Banks, uh, Ted Roof, it doesn't matter how far back you want to go. Yeah. It's all about what you do once you get to the school. And everything that came before that uh, can quickly be thrown out the window if the results aren't coming on the field come the fall. And the results on the field are something that I think are – James Franklin talked about this at the very end of his pref, press conference. If you want to go watch his full comments, go, go do that after the show. But this is something where – 
I've discussed this, and this is kind of a major theme for last year, which I why I personally was a little bit slow to adopt Penn State's uh, two tight end offense. And he explains the value of receivers, especially from from a very plain and tactical standpoint. It's a little bit longer of a clip, almost two minutes, but I think he lays it out very clearly of why receivers and the receivers coach is so important. Um, In terms of the room, you know, I'm just a big believer, you know, that if you look at the NFL and you look at college football, um, the room and the position that I think can be maybe the most impactful right now is the wide receivers. Those guys at the NFL level as well as college um, are able to to change the game and change the game quickly. Um, you make you make one person miss on the perimeter as a chance to go 80 yards. Um, if you're a running back, you're probably gonna have to make two or three guys miss before you go 80. So the game has become such a space game. Uh, you have guys on the outside that can go 80 at any moment. Um, that changes defensive coordinators. That puts the fear in people. Uh, and the, honestly, the other thing is it impacts the running game. You know, when you're able to have guys on the outside that people don't feel like they can match up with in one-on-one situations, then they have to put a safety over the top, remove that safety from the box, which now creates more of a balanced <clears throat> defense in terms of what they're trying to defend and what they're trying to stop. So I actually think it's going to be as impactful as our running game as it will be in our passing game. But that's to me what what I'm looking for is I'm looking for us to develop and recruit a room uh, that people in our conference are fearful of uh, and also on a national on a national scale as well. Somebody asked me this week, and, and I wish I would have said something like that in terms of what's the difference between Penn State and Michigan and Ohio State. Like, how do they get over the hump? What is What are the things they need to do? And the answer, it's not as simple as that, right? So it's not as simple as recruit and develop elite wide receivers. Because if you're not good everywhere, then it doesn't matter. So it's everything. And that's the, the, the answer there is, is right of like, you need to be good. It's the small margins, all that stuff. But when you have an offense led by a tight end, it's the same thing what he said about running backs. If you are channeling through less explosive and the potential of these big plays you know finding a guy that can give you big plays not every single time they touch the ball but routinely if you're channeling through the running game or the tight ends you can be somewhat explosive but the the true dynamic offenses the reason the eagles greg i don't need to tell you this the reason the eagles are in the super bowl is because they got aj brown and they've got uh, the slim reaper out there where you've got two guys on the outside that you can't single cover for too long and then Jalen Hurts is a great distributor of the football. He's a very smart quarterback that's improved. And that gives Miles Sanders so much room to run. You have a complete team like that. You have balanced threats. The defense, that's when you get in the situation. Defense does not have a right answer for your offense because you've threatened all parts of the field. It's just harder to do it with tight ends. Right. <clears throat> yeah, there's no doubt about that. So, you know, again, and that, and the end of that answer is, again, another one of those things when you look at it and say, OK, this James Franklin has a belief that they need something and he is looking for the person to go do it. I'm looking for us to very well or I'm sorry, develop very well and recruit room that people in our conference are fearful of and also on a national scale as well. There's your answer. If you're yeah. looking for any kind of uh, explanation as to why this change may have been made or what is, is expected moving forward, there it is. And right now, I wouldn't say Penn State has a receiver's room that people should fear. Now, could yeah. that change quickly in September? Of course it could. We talked about that. Maybe you and I on the mailbag show last week or the live show two weeks ago. I can't remember. But, you know, we talked about that. There's potential there in that room for sure, but it must be realized. And there is some speed in that room and there is some explosion. And there are guys that can play in space, but T. Frankie knows well as I do. It's great to sit here in February and say it's possible that those guys can do it. But if they don't do it in September, it doesn't really matter what we thought on paper and from the practice field and everything else they could do. So certainly a position group to watch closely here moving forward. 
And the guys that they've brought in that are here right now, even Malik McLean, hasn't proven that he can do it on the field to the level that I'd say even he expects of himself. The reason right. he leave, left Florida State is because he's behind other guys that were making plays. And again, right. that might be a talent and talent situation, but until we see it and until we see the quarterbacks deliver that ball to those players, you you can only have confidence. You can't have any sort of facts yeah. that you're working with, which is where we love to be, Greg. We love to have facts and actually like, no, these are the things. The unknown is the unknown. Anything left from Marcus Hagens and James Franklin before we get into some of those players that we talked to that you want to to wrap up this conversation and, and maybe kind of a theme between the two of them? No, I think we kind of hit all the dots. But yeah, I mean, look, I just think you, you it goes back to what we said at the beginning is that the push to 2023 is here. That's for Marcus Hagens in this receiver's room. That's for James Franklin and the rest of his coaching staff. That's for these players who are now starting winter workouts. And for anyone that's not familiar with those, I mean, they are twice a week, very challenging, very competitive uh, sets of drills that the strength staff puts together uh, to really test these guys mentally, physically, et cetera, from a competition standpoint, excuse me, and so on. And so, you know, there's a lot to be gained over the next handful of weeks here before Penn State hits spring break and then ultimately spring practice. So, you know, again, you can't lose the championship in February, but you can help your uh, way down the path to winning one by getting a lot done during the next uh, month. And then, of course, during the two months of spring practice. So, no, that's kind of my, my read on it at this point is that everyone's ready to charge full speed ahead into the new chapter of the 2023 Nittany Lions. And the time to do so is now. Yeah. One of the things that uh, Marcus Hagan said, and we can transition into the players that I that I thought was maybe a little bit illuminating is some of the guys didn't have the same conditioning as the best guys in the room, and we need to get everyone up to speed. And that was one of the things I talked about uh, with Deny Dennis Sutton and some of the players that I talked to was work during January before you even get into to conditioning is like that. If you're an athlete like that part should never stop. So just one aside before we get into that. Um, and I can talk, we'll talk about that with Deny Dennis Sutton, but I want to know who you talked to because you got to talk to a lot more players than I did. So let's start with Christian Driver. What were your initial takeaways from the newly minted receiver uh, yeah. for Penn State? He's listed as an athlete on the roster, so I don't even know how to introduce him. Yeah, no, he's a receiver now. They've made that change. He's going to be on that side of the ball moving forward. Basically just said that uh, what James Franklin has said all along, there's no big secret here. Penn State wanted to try him at safety. When he got here, he approached them and said, hey, I think my future and my comfort level is going to be best on the other side of the ball. And they said, okay, well, we need you in the secondary through the end of this season. And then we're going to make that transition happen. And he was willing to wait on that timeline. He was patient to reach the point of now when he can finally make that transition. And we'll see. I mean, I think that, you know, again, he looks good from a body perspective. Can he come in immediately, shake up this room? I wouldn't rule it out. I'm also not going to say it's a guarantee, but we're talking about a guy who was able to play defensive back, albeit not a ton, but some uh, in his first season on campus, despite thinking his best football is played on the other side of the line of scrimmage. So I really liked what I got to learn from him. He's very polished as a speaker. I'm sure he'll be very polished as a receiver, considering the family lineage there with his dad, Donald, of course. So, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But he is one guy I think everyone's going to have their eye on when we get to that first spring practice as we get through a few spring practices and, then of course, reach the blue-white game. Just curious to see what kind of progression he's making as he's now settling into this receiver role, which, is, again, is one he's played before. Uh, but it's certainly one that he hasn't played in the college uh, at the college level yet. Yeah, and he didn't, honestly, like watching his high school film, he didn't get a ton of chances at receiver either. You know, there there was, he was primarily a safety in high school as well. So uh, I'm excited to see, because what I did see from him in high school, I really liked his route running, surprise, surprise. I liked what he was able to do, and I think he could create separation. The question is going to be, like you said, from a physical standpoint, can he do that? And that was, I think, the conversation to play him at safety. It, it that but that physicality, that size, the tenacity, the route running, that's something that I'm interested in. Here, let's do it this way. Greg, these are the players that we we had that we plan to talk about. If you've got a question about some of the players that we have uh, spoken to, throw it in the chat, and we'll get to those questions throughout the show. But uh, Christian Driver, Vega Iwane, Caleb Artis, and Makai Flowers, all from the class of 23. I talked to uh, Drew Aller and Denied Dennis Sutton, so we'll be getting to those guys. If you've got a question about any of those players... 
throw it in the chat. If you got a question about a different player, throw it in the chat too. Um, anything else from Christian? Because I want to talk about Vega. I'm very interested in, in what you thought of his personality and how he came off. Yeah, no, we can transition right to there. I, I just will say that, again, I, I will emphasize that Christian Driver is a guy to watch closely. In this receiver's room, we didn't have him on the rundown, but I did chat with Tyler Johnson a bit. He's definitely bigger at T-Frank than he was at this time last year. Um, and certainly he's a guy who I would say is worth watching closely. Omari Evans I spoke to briefly. That young group of receivers is interesting, but – it's also interesting because I believe there's now five members. I don't have the, the roster in front of me, and it all yes. runs together at this point. But five members, I believe, of the class of 2022 in that receivers room now. It's a lot of guys from one class in one room, also considering the fact you have some older guys ahead of them, some younger guys behind them, and some transfers. So uh, this is a big spring, maybe a bigger spring than anticipated for a lot of these guys because – you know, again, you can develop throughout your career and you have chances to climb the depth chart throughout your career. But this is a separating spring for a lot of those guys in that room, at least the ones that want to earn the number one job, the number two job, the number three job in this offense. And I'll just be fascinated to see how it plays out. I kind of want to put Trey Wallace in that group, too, because I know he's a year older. But very much in a similar situation. He played last year much more than those those young guys. But I still... Yeah. In a lot of ways, I still think of him as a young receiver, even though he's entering his third year at Penn State. So it really is. There's a lot of young talent, and they've got to they've got to prove something before, uh, you know, the the start of fall camp for us to know who's going to be where on the roster. Um. So so what about Vega? What what stood out to you about him? He's I think a guy that Penn State fans are very excited about. What did you learn about him from speaking to him? Yeah, so he's getting some work, T. Frank, at center in addition to guard. So not an uh, overwhelmingly amazing revelation there. Uh, Penn State has cross-trained these guys, especially the interior ones, for a number of years now. So not exactly, the uh, again, the, the biggest breaking news that you could ever find at one of these things. But did thought it was interesting that he didn't snap, obviously, in high school. He played tackle in high school. So yeah. that was a new skill for him to learn. And Hey, the sooner the better. Uh, you know, when we go back to that leadership question, T. Frank, I, I strongly believe that Hunter Norzad, who uh, we expect to be this year's center, is going to be in that leadership council conversation. Uh, I don't know if they, I don't think they actually do the leadership council anymore, at least not release it publicly. But point being is that uh, he should be one of the guys, an older member of the team who's played a lot of college football, is expected to be the starting center, one of the more important positions on the field. So I think he's going to be in that realm of guys that answer the leadership question that we talked about earlier in the show but you know the the point i'm getting at here is hunter norzad didn't just start snapping the ball overnight you know he was cross-trained at a point in his career to be able to do this and step into that role and penn state fans should be excited that vega is in that similar role now as well where he's being molded as an interior guy right guard and center is what he's yeah. been working the most at and you know the future is the hopes are high for him and it's another interesting position battle because you got returners there and you got young guys coming to push them. And I think there's no question that Vega will push Landon Tangwall and Sal Warmly and the other older members of the roster who are in front of them. So, you know, one thing I think that's hard, and I'm getting a little bit, uh, you know, head over skis here, but, you know, when you talk to all these guys in one day, you, you can sometimes have the recency bias of forgetting about the other members of the roster who weren't yeah. there that day. So I don't want to go too far over, uh, you know, over the skis here and suggest that all these guys are going to make this big amazing push past older players into playing time but I mean again when you think about what the class members uh, 2022 guys that burned the red shirts did there was a lot of guys Vega being one of them who in a different world in a different time probably could have and definitely would have burned their red shirt if the situation yeah. called for it at Penn State so you know there's a lot of competition coming from this group across the board and obviously, some of them have already been won. Some of them will be contested here, uh, of course, including at the quarterback position. Then others will be uh, taken throughout the roster. But yeah, a lot to work with here. I know he's a player you're very excited about too. Yeah, uh, having seen him up close recently, uh, just I, I want to. We're we're gonna be giving you some stuff here on social media. Um, I he's really really athletic. 330 pounds and really athletic. I want to get to this. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about this, Greg, because I some things fly over my head, and uh, I don't know what Monsoor No Hands means. That is somebody uh, who donated to the channel. I was waiting around for a question from Monsoor No Hands who donated to the show. Appreciate you very much. Uh, I hope your name isn't a troll. 
I have no idea. I hope it's not. Uh, but if you have a question, throw it up here and we'll get it on the show as well. Um, the other guys you talked to, what stood out to you about Caleb Artis? Another guy on the roster that young, but obvious one technique potential. What were your conversations like with him? And, and, and how do you feel like, what was your sense of his maturity or his, his uh, progress from last season? Yeah, 6'4", 315, really big kid, really well put together kid, and he is very confident in his abilities moving into this second year under John Scott, John Scott Jr. in Manny Diaz's defense. So we'll see. You know, I don't know if he's still a year away or not, T. Frank. I think we'll have a better feel for that after spring practice. But as we've talked about before, Penn State's looking for bodies either in the rotation or otherwise uh, at defensive tackle right now. So, you know, again, all of these guys in this class and across the roster – there are many, many players who you're going to look at when you see that first updated roster of the spring and say, okay, how did their body change since January in the Rose Bowl? And what does that mean for what they can do in spring practice? So time will tell uh, what those answers will end up being. But, you know, I think that when I, I talked to him, I just got the sense that uh, he is not going to – he was so, he is someone that will put in the work to try and get to where he wants to go and where he thinks he should go and to earn what he thinks he deserves. So it was just an enlightening conversation with him. I had not had the chance to get to know him during the recruiting process. So I was just blown away by the passion he has for football and the drive he has for football and what – it's going to take to uh, reach the point in his career where he gets the playing time that he wants. You also said he hasn't had anything from the creamer yet because he doesn't think that was the best for his nutritional needs, which is probably <laughs> a good idea. He also said when he got not here, even he a cheat looked, day. No, I mean, come on, there's a cheat day. There's always a cheat day, but not for these guys, apparently. So I guess he was also uh, discovered Ben and Jerry's when he got down here in State College earlier uh, uh, last year. So that was a funny little aside on the ice cream front, too. But it's also a good reminder that you're trying to put weight on, and there's lots of ways to do it. I know all the bad ways, but you know there's <laughs> lots of ways to do it. But to get to a point, you know, we sit here sometimes, T. Frank, and we talk about, you know, this guy needs to get bigger to play in the Big Ten. This guy needs to do this or that. Well, yeah, you can do it, but the way they need to do it and the way the rest of us do it are two entirely different things and two entirely different processes. And Caleb Ortiz seems to be going about his process the right way. I love the idea that he's six, four, three fifteen, and ice cream is not on the menu. Like, yeah, that's, that's uh some guys don't need help putting on weight because they're just, you know, they're just big. That's, that's the way they're built. And those are the guys that you're looking for. Um, we, we, we talk, I talked to Drew Aller and, if you want to get his full comments, um, we have that video up right now. We put that up this afternoon. Uh, you can check that out. But I was just really impressed when when you said earlier, Zane Durant said Drew Aller's a leader. He just doesn't know it yet. When you said that, I'm like, yeah, I know. I already, I immediately know what you're talking about. A very poised, smart, confident young man who sat there. I was there for the full 30 minutes. He answered questions and and answered the same question and gave a different and interesting answer each time while also not saying anything he wasn't supposed to. And just the ability, when you've been in these, Greg, you know what it's like when a guy knows he's not supposed to say something and like he's asked a couple different ways and he's getting uncomfortable. Drew did a great job of like, people want to know, what, okay, what are you good at? What are you trying to work on? What are the areas of your game that are going to define the offense if you're the starter? That's all information. You know, James Franklin was was asked frankly last year, what isn't he good at? And James was like, I don't want to tell you because then teams know. Everybody right. else knows. So like there are all these state secrets that, that Drew is trying to keep as the quarterback. And he just maneuvered through all of that so very well. And he rode that balance, and this is kind of the, the, the crux of this situation, talking about leadership, is you have a sophomore or a redshirt freshman quarterback. And again, we don't want to gloss over Bo Perbula, who got a, a lot of praise from, from Drew and from a lot of his teammates today of, you know, he does a lot of things really well, and he has uh, helped force those guys to grow. But you've got to have a young quarterback. So if you're not the starter, you haven't named the starter and you're Drew Aller yet, how do you balance learning and leading and he talked about that in a lot of really honest and open ways and a lot of ways that i think if you're looking for the right answer to that question he knew the right answer so just wildly impressive 
Um, I don't know if you came over. Did you have a chance to to see anything from Drew, or did you hear any of the the uh, replay from anybody else? Uh, just a little bit, T. Frank. But again, he's always come across as well polished, very good in an interview setting. And I think the one thing that is important to remember, and, he, and you kind of hit on it here, but you know, these guys, depending on who they are, uh, you know, there was probably. I mean, just to set the scene for everyone, what, 30 reporters and media members there today, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they bring them out in, you know, groups of 10 or 12, whatever the division is of however many players were in that class. I'm not good at math and I'm not good at it right now. So I'm just not even going to give it a shot. But, you know, the point being is that, you know, your, your big names, your Drew Allers, your Deny Dennis Suttons, your Zane Durant's, Nick Singleton's, Katron Allen's, uh, they're going to draw a lot of people at first and then everyone's going to disperse to, you know, other players who are there. And, you know, in a situation like we're fortunate enough to have with you and Sean Fitz, Nate Bauer, and Ryan Snyder, we were able to blanket cover a lot of those guys. You can't obviously get, you know, we can't all get to uh, 12 guys at once. But yeah, the point I'm getting at here is that there are a lot of repeat questions asked, and some guys handle it better than others. Drew Aller as a starting quarterback who everyone wanted to get a soundbite from or get a question into – undoubtedly, as you said, and you listened there for 30 minutes, you know the answer to this, but he undoubtedly answered the same question or same version of the same question multiple times, and that can frustrate a lot of guys, but he seemed, from what I was able to listen to, pretty unflappable. And Bo Perbula was great, too. I, I think we should get, yeah, I definitely want to mention him as well. I had about four-minute chat with him, and, you know, he was asked a very direct question of, hey, look, uh, you're being, you know, the outside noise says you're not the guy. You're not yeah. Drew. You're not going to be the starter. How do you handle that? And he had a great response. He basically said, look, I'm here to try and, and improve and, and make this team better. And obviously, Drew and I compete. And, you know, I don't pay attention to that stuff. And I have a hard time believing that in totality because I have a hard time thinking that you wouldn't at least hear some of it and, and some take some of it to heart. I'm not saying he's lying. I'm just saying that I feel like with as much talk has been going on about this yeah. situation, it feels like to me, T. Frank, that it'd be hard to just completely turn it out and ignore it. And that's what the best athletes in the world do, or they use it as fuel in a positive way, not in a negative way. But I was impressed by him as well. Penn State has a good quarterback room here. Again, yeah. J James Franklin said it. I'm not going to try and sit here and tell you the book on Jackson Smolik. I mean, we know him as a guy that Penn State went out and got to fill its quarterback hole in the class of 2023, but we just don't know enough about him yet, so I don't even want to go too far down that road. But at the top, they have two good guys, and that should be uh, one other thing to mention, T. Frank, and I'll be quick here, but James Franklin was basically asked, I'm paraphrasing here, and correct me if I'm mischaracterizing what he said, but long story short, he was asked, hey, do you want a guy in the portal yeah. that has some veteran experience? And he kind of just shrugged, and there was a it was a longer answer, but he yeah. kind of kind of shrugged and said, "Well, yeah, but where are we going to find one of those guys that wants to come here?" <laughs> is more or less what he was getting at. I I've said this all for all off season. The Chase Daniels of college football doesn't exist because no. there's no dude that you want to bring in that's a career backup in college. Like they're either right. starters or they want to be starters, or they're probably not the level that's worth. You know, that, that can bring in and if you need them will provide you the level of play that you're looking for. Like, so right. it is a very hard thing to find. Uh, Brian, he echoes these sentiments about Drew Aller. Really impressed with <laughs> Drew Aller's demeanor. Penn State does a great job of finding good players. They also seem like good people. Um, and I would I would agree with that. Like, you know, you've heard Kirk Herbstreet say stuff, stuff like that of it just they all are cut from a similar cloth. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that they're all polished. If you listen right. to Abdul Carter answer questions, he does not want to be there. But that also doesn't mean that he's not a good dude. It, that doesn't mean that he's not also a mature, serious, and uh, thoughtful person. It's just some people like the uh, – the some people do press conferences better. A couple questions here. Uh, we did get one from Monster No Hands. I think we all have dreams and aspirations for the quarterback, and therefore Penn State will look like this year with uh, ceiling sky high. What's the risk of the floor for the young quarterbacks? Drew Aller, Bo Bueller is lower than we hope. I mean, I've been kind of saying that all offseason, and recently, Greg, I've had to choose to be more optimistic. You know, that like meeting Drew Aller and watching the way he performed last year, he was good, and he performed well. Bo Perbula, I loved his high school tape. I think he's got some of the tools to operate an offense that can be successful. So I don't think it's a low floor, but I do think it's lower than some fans want to admit. 
What do you? I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. No, we talked about this a few weeks ago here on the channel, T. Frank, and uh, you really made a strong case about that. And it's a totally fair one. I do think that there has to be some level of realization that what everyone thinks is going to happen and what might actually happen with a first year starting quarterback who's a second year player either way. Uh, can be two vastly different things. Now, again, we're talking about a five-star. We're talking about a guy who did not have to start in year one and was able to get game experience in mostly low-pressure situations, minus that trip in the second uh, first drive of the second half at Purdue, uh, which, of course, he did uh, fare fairly well in for the most part. But, I mean, yeah, I, I think that there's – on some one hand, it is a fair expectation to say – Programs across the country get five stars all the time and they come in and play in year one and they perform well or they play in year two and perform well. Penn State shouldn't expect lower, but there's a reality that it could be lower. So, yeah, I, yeah. there's a risk involved with that. No question. And I think we remember the guys that do hit, but there's a lot of quarterbacks out there that don't. Like, yeah. I'm just randomly thinking, I think that Florida State – that I feel like for like five years in a row, they had like a high four star or some really talented player that just didn't work out. And and that's the reality. I'm not saying it's either of these guys. That's not their reality. But we tend to because we want to we, we want we want these things like if you're a Penn State fan, you want this truth to be true. Um, so you'll you'll think those things and, and you'll kind of maybe not see the whole picture. Steven's back here. He's got a question. New receivers, new quarterback. What do you think we'll take out of the playbook early in the season? Uh, top of my head, full field reads. Maybe they won't be doing as much of, you know, maybe some mirrored concepts and some spread stuff where it's more of look at what is out there and then pick the guy you're supposed to throw to pre-snap, trying to make it a little bit easier formationally. But yeah, some of the complex reads that, that Sean Clifford was able to execute late, uh, late in his career, probably that stuff, which right. makes third down difficult putting third and 10 that might make those situations a little more difficult, which is something that Drew Aller talked about. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, just don't get into third and ten, and you won't have to worry about it. Um, uh, no, other than that, I think you hit the nail right on the head, T. Frank. And yeah, I mean, those are the things that we talk about the risk of lower, um, excuse me, output than maybe what people think out of the gate. Yeah, those are the tricky areas where you might run into some slow progress early in the season as you're trying to get him up to speed and comfortable with things he has never seen before. And yeah. West Virginia and the Illinois and Iowa, and the teams that Penn State plays early in the season, guess what? They all know what they're facing, and they all know what he's seen and has not seen at the college level, and therefore they're going to try and take advantage of some of these things, and that's what Mike Yersich is going to have to game plan around. Yeah, I mean, you can make a cover three look like a cover six, like a cover one, like a cover four, and that's what good defenses are able to do is fool the quarterback pre-snap, and if you lock in and you don't, read post snap i think we talked about pre-snap with him today and that was another question he did a great job of sidestepping like it was he was in the pocket and he was trying to evade pressure um but th those are the things like you can read it pre-snap it doesn't mean that's what it is post snap so that recognition is is direly important in those in those obvious passing situations uh we do have to get going here soon and i did want to get to deny dennis sutton i was able to talk to him for a little bit and i just wanted to play you this one clip of what he said that he's uh, working on this off season because I think it's very important to the story at defensive end this year. Um, I don't know if I can singly pick out one part. Um, just everything, just learn the game, learn the technique, staying low. You know, coming out of my stance, that was a big thing I had this past season was me being a taller guy. I would naturally start to rise up coming out of my stance. So just coming out of the shoot every day, striking the bag. Um, and yeah, that if that. If it was one thing, I would say that, but just all around, I have to work on everything, yeah. So I, this is probably just me being me, but it's the one thing that I've said about his profile going back to high school, that he's a tall, like he said, he's a tall dude. He, send, he tends to stand up straight out of his set, and that limits his abilities. It limits his power, his movement skills, his pass rushing stuff, and it's on film. You can go back and you can look at it and you can look at the effectiveness of him versus the other guys. And what I talked to him about was, you know, what are you doing outside of 
uh, winter workouts, which started today. There's there's a whole month between the end of the season and today. And what are you working on? And and those things, using his hands. He talked about uh, working with MMA to get better with his hands. He's already used his hands well. But like when we talk about Denai Dennis and becoming a five star, and the expectations for him specifically in a stacked room where he's not going to just get plays because he's denied Dennis Sutton. It's one area that I think that he needed to work on. And if he is able to overcome that, the sky is the limit for this defensive end room. You've got the just three guys already that have proven they are disruptors with Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson, and Amin Vanover, who we can't forget in this conversation. If you add in denied Dennis Sutton and he's able to master this part of his game, like I said, it's the only thing ha- holding him back from being an elite pass rusher. And if he's working on that, he's a humble, self-aware, smart guy. And you put all that together with that talent, you know, I think I am more optimistic about his ability to translate that to the field, having that conversation with him, having him say those things, that it's more likely to happen for him this year than it was at the gate last season, where he was good, but I think there was probably a little bit of like, I thought he was a five-star. He should be like a Bosa or whatever. And these are the reasons. These are the small details why. So I'm optimistic for Penn State fans that that's going to happen. Anything, we've reached an hour. I don't want to take any more of your time specifically. Having a great time with everyone here. Anything, last thoughts, Greg? Yeah, I just think that, again, the winter workouts are here, folks. It is time to get ready for 2023. We no longer have to argue about uh, the returner at this position or that position <laughs> or this play call or that play call or what have you. It's full steam on to 2023. Circus Sports just released as we were uh, talking here. It's cha- championship odds for next season. Penn State still checking in with the seventh best odds behind, of course, Ohio State, Michigan, and a whole bunch of others. But... Uh, you know, the hype train on this team isn't slowing down, T. Frank, and a lot of the players and people we've talked about over the last hour are the reason why. Yeah, we, well, we have to get going because I have been uh, staving off the spam bots in the chat, uh, but I can only do so much. They're overrunning me. I do want to say before we get going, please subscribe to Blue White, Blue White Illustrated here on YouTube. Uh, a lot of fun stuff coming up this week. We got the mailbag on Thursday because tomorrow... We're talking to Lana Montgomery, Penn State player in the class of 2023. Uh, He suffered an ACL injury before the start of the season. And for the first time, he's opening up to somebody to talk about that process, where he is, and update where he is on his progress back from that injury. So exclusive interview coming up tomorrow with Lana Montgomery. I meant to say it at like minute nine. Here we are at the end of the show because I recorded that right before we jumped on live. So I've been here talking on the camera for an hour and a half so we need to get going because uh i think my my wife is getting mad so that'll do it for the bwi daily edition thank you so much to greg thank you to everybody who participated in the show we'll be back next tuesday with another live show hopefully we'll have something super interesting to talk about Uh, not hopefully we're definitely going to have something super interesting to talk about until then we'll talk to you tomorrow